What up? We're here again. We're doing this whole podcast thing. This time we have legendary, legendary, legendary status Formula Drift pro driver Nick Novak. Hey Nick, what's up? Oh my hey, god! Hey, what's going on, guys? Man, we are super excited to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been since SEMA. Yeah, but or yesterday. Good to see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Technicalities. But. Yeah, pretty much. We had some <laughs> t- technical difficulties yesterday that allowed us to have the opportunity to hang out with Nick two days in a row, which yes. is super cool. Yes. Um, man, so you've uh, you've had an interesting start to your second season in pro. <coughs> yeah, we. Uh teamed up with jerry yang racing this year which is big uh, like for for people i don't want to cut you off but for people that don't know jerry yang racing has been around for like i don't know i want to say ever is that fair yeah yeah it's been a long time he's been at it for a long time and yeah yeah he's i mean he's one of the best yeah. it's 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 pretty incredible to me that um well first off let's let's rewind this for a second you um you so so you're teamed up now with a team that has Nate Chen mm-hmm. and and uh Tug- Tuzuya, I why can't Tug- I ever do this? Yep. <laughs> Taguchi. Yep. Yeah. Um what an interesting dynamic. How have you how have you started to kind of fit in uh to this cuz they're an existing program in a sense. So how have you started to really fit in uh to the to the squad here? so it's it's been a pretty easy transition we're still learning how to you know share data what what can be shared across different chassis because they're both in frs's yeah 46 mm-hmm. but you know things like track data speeds stuff like that it's all it's all easy to to share between each other and then uh you know they're they're great dudes too so they're yeah. super easy to work with and Nate also spots for Kazuya, so that's another dynamic there too. Right. Oh yeah, def- definitely. And then so now here's something that's interesting to me. Kind of moving your program forward from let's say last year to this year. Have there been any stark differences that you've seen, whether it be trips to, and you don't have to say what they are. I'm not looking for secrets here. Have there been any Ticks, uh, tr- why can't I speak? Tips or tricks? Yeah, that's tips, what I'm looking for. Tips or tricks. Uh, that's why I'm here. For- right, right, for <laughs> pronunciation. <laughs> Have there been any little things or program assets in the learning experience of kind of getting your program ready to work with, you know, uh, with Jerry Yang's team? Have, has there been anything that you've picked up from them just from the nature of how long they've been kind of doing some of these things or has it kind of been like i brought my own experience to the table and honestly we just flow really well together and having them as kind of a uh an asset um as far as you know support and stuff has been the major piece yeah i mean working with them's been super incredible like i mean teaming up with the pro race team you don't often get to do that especially going from running things yourself and just the the level of professionalism too is is nice like um you know being under the the gt rig also not having to transport my own car to the to the track right. is is a huge stress reliever too because mm-hmm. i show up i know my car is going to be there i know it's going to be set up ready to go and i just hop in it and drive and it's you know it takes almost all the stress besides the driving aspect off of it that must be a nice feeling yeah, so, so, and and this is really, I mean, I think if you're going to look at stark comparisons, and you tell me if I'm wrong, this is really one of the major ones, is that you go from a program last year where you have to really have, be intricate in transporting your car and getting your car prepped and all these different things to now having uh, kind of a team that's able to allow you 
to kind of I, I would say fly in, right? Because I mean, you're 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 East Coast based. They're West Coast based. Uh, no, they're actually based here in Atlanta. But Get out. Yeah, no they're idea. they're about an hour and a half away. So okay, it's, were... it's a little bit of a drive, but uh, it's it's worth it. I go down there maybe once or twice a week. I thought that's my bad. I thought they were in California. Yeah, I did too. Uh, so so Kazuya is based in L.A. And, okay, and is is um, running up garage out there. Right. Uh, Nate is in I think D.C. and then uh, the team is based here uh, out of McDonough. Wow. So you so you got the lucky end of that of that yeah. piece. But but so but they're helping you with transport and set up and all that stuff uh, yeah. before each event, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the chassis this year is actually a, a fresh new chassis that they built also. Okay. So that's interesting. So what made you, uh, you know, kind of, so you ditched your, your last E46 chassis you used last year? So I, I still have it, but yeah, it's just a, a, a rolling shell right now. Okay. Sitting as a, as a backup. So hopefully I don't have to use it, but right. yeah, it's seen some stuff. What was the major reasoning behind doing that? Was it really just because, like, in the first stage of you building that platform, there was things you didn't really get to do, like stitch welding or whatever it is? Or was this like, hey, let's, we have other things or other cage designs? Or what was the, what was the leading cause between saying, you know what, let's, let's just build a new one? So a lot of it came down to the car was tired. When we got the car, it had already seen four seasons of competition right. from a previous pro driver. And he he wasn't super kind to it, right? So, <laughs> and then me putting another three seasons on it, it it had seen enough. There was you know the subframe was bent and the chassis itself, and it had been pulled straight before, and then right. bent itself again just from wear, just because it gets soft from all the fatigue. But then another thing that we changed with the new chassis was the biggest thing was seating position. So I was actually able to position the seat where I wanted it, position the pedals where I wanted it. I'm not, you know, cramped up and basically a cage designed for somebody else. I'm yeah. comfortable and where I want to be in the car. And for those of that, that don't know Nick um, or haven't seen him in person, pretty tall guy. You're, yeah, you're a pretty tall dude. So, yeah. so uh, you know, I would imagine that when you, you know, that's your office, right? When you, yeah. when you go to work, you want to be able yeah. to like, you know, be comfortable in that, in that office, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, talking to a bunch of people, comfort's a huge thing, especially at the pro level. Right, and so you've gotten now one event under your belt, Long Beach. Um, which let me ask you a question right off the bat: Do you do you like Long Beach? Is that an event that you like? I heard this is one of those uh, one of those events that I feel like every year you you hear people they either love it or they hate it. There's really no in between. So there's aspects of it I do love the track itself i don't right <laughs> so I, I love that it's a, a city course you know you've got walls surrounding it. it it's a real challenge but things i don't like are the inconsistencies in the pavement which you don't actually yeah. hear a lot about it, you know you go from a street to a parking lot to a different parking lot back right. to another street but there's several service changes in between and then the way the rubber gets laid down between all those different surfaces also changes. So depending on the time of day, you'll have a ton of grip. And then two runs later, you have no grip on the same course in the same spot. Wow. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like, cause I, you know, for years I've heard about, you know, the quote unquote marbles complaint, which is yeah. like, you know, there's this, there's this fine area. It's what, uh, that would be a one, two, three, it's turn three, right? Like when you come into that outer, like yeah. there's the chunks of tires and all the different, you know, debris that end up on the track. It's like when, when you kind of drop a tire off into that, it turns into like an ice skating competition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you go too deep in that, plus there's all broken taillights and bumper fragments and all sorts of other stuff too, that get laid down. Cause <laughs> right. I mean, Long Beach is not a forgiving track. No. And it's funny because it looks, I think for the average, um, layman person, me, right. Rich. Yeah. Me. So for rich, it, when you look at the track, you actually think it's, look, it's not that big of a track. It's not right. that long. It's, it's, it's not, it looks pretty simple, but it's actually a very technical course. Well, that's all they right. kept saying when I was watching, they just kept saying over and over again, that, you know, how technical it is. But yeah. I'll tell you what you said. I, I would agree when I was looking at it, it did look kind of um, simple and yes. basic. But again, what the hell do I know? <laughs> well, 
and you I, know? And I think the announcers, they have a big job there for the people that are on the live stream because yeah. they have to try to allow people to understand that there's a lot of technicality here and there's a lot of issues that the drivers are facing because when you start to see, you know, like I even think about it the other, uh, what was it last year, two years ago, Turk basically in practice destroyed his car going right into the, that tire wall there. So like yeah. it's, you're, it's not, it's not like there's not like the people that are become victims mm -hmm. just don't have the skill set. It's like, you could find yourself in a whole lot of trouble real fast. Wow. Yeah, I mean, especially with the unpredictability of the actual surfaces, like you can go, okay, yeah, I'm gonna be at this wall, and then next thing you know, you're three feet into it, and it grabs you and spins you around and flings you to the next wall. So. Right. So the 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 thing that I've also heard from drivers over the course of the years, you you can comment on this, um, is just. Like, hey, the problem with this whole thing is you really have to be perfect from the beginning. Like, this track doesn't allow, and this course and this layout doesn't allow for really a lot of correction once you're offline. Like, they say, like, you start online or you struggle your whole way. Sound right? Yeah. yeah. If you don't enter on that perfect spot, you're going to miss the first wall, and then it's going to throw you off for the rest of the run. Yeah. There's no recovery pretty much. And then any any and and that really adds another complication which is you can be inches onto that wall and that wall really can suck you in and throw everything off with just a little bit of contact. Yeah. Yeah, and those those marbles. <laughs> and, and you know, and that's and that's the part that I think is is sometimes difficult for people to really understand is that you know, you're talking about inches, right? You come into that, into that, you know, that, that second big turn where you got, you, you know, you got the, that wall there and like, you know, two inches, you're really close to the wall. You're doing right. You're online two more inches. You're into the wall. And now all of a sudden your, your attitudes changed. And like, you have to now try to get back online to be able to be into as far as you can into the other wall without hitting the other wall. Right. It's, it's pretty nasty. Yeah, like, I mean, there were several people in practice, too, who, you know, just went that little bit too deep, and it grabbed them, pulls the front end in, and then you've got, you know, not just your rear end that you're fixing, but you've got your whole front suspension assembly that you're fixing, too. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, that could be a lot of damage and a really expensive fixed, you know, fix with, with being inches off. I mean, inches. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, Long Beach does have pretty fast entry speeds right by the time you get going yeah i'd say it's probably close to 80 i want to say yeah wow. but you're entering into a blind turn right so <laughs> right. You're, you're throwing it in and you're just like okay where is it where is it oh, okay there it is right just so trying to, trying to see so from a driving standpoint give me like a little bit of what happens there right because we obviously know about getting lost in the smoke line and different things that happen you know, let's say in the chase position, but, but like, do you, when you're setting out in practice for Long Beach, how do you create that, that, that confidence into that blind chuck there? Is there, is there muddle, muscle memory? Is there uh, a, a, a way that you kind of like count in your head? How do you create that, that, that rhythm so that you can have a little bit more confidence when you know that you can't have visibility? A lot of it, uh, for the drivers that have been there several times, I'm sure it is muscle memory. Uh, only being there once before this year, it was a lot of like, okay, did I do this? Did I do that? And then trying that and saying, okay, this this is exactly what I did and this worked. Yeah. Now, before you get to that big hairpin turn before the finish line, I feel like that's the place that if you're in a chase position – and you're gonna get lost in the smoke, I feel like that's the place that's gonna happen almost every time. And then you have a pretty much hairpin turn that you have to <laughs> navigate through. Is there anything that you try to do into that area of the track to make sure you don't get stuck in that smoke? Um, a lot of it, I mean, you just gotta stick with the person in front of you. Like coming off of the outside three, um, 
you know, you're still on throttle and you're accelerating out of that turn straight towards the wall and you're transitioning towards the wall for the touch and go, but you need to time that transition to where you're not, you're not going to hit them as soon as they transition and you come through the smoke. You don't want to plow into them because, I mean, you see that so many times. Right. So just getting that timing down is key. I mean, and this is, you know, it's hard because, like, you don't, you don't use this track in, in, in prospect, but, you know, I would imagine that there is a great um, amount of, of you have to have confidence in the driver that you're especially like when you're in the chase position the driver in front of you that they're going to be kind of consistent and and have a clue what they're doing because at the end of the day um all speed changes you know for the lead driver going into that into that hairpin turn they they have a big effect on how that chase car operates and and we and you've seen plenty of contact and i think this gets confusing for people in the live stream where they'll have contact with a car, like the chase car will have contact into the lead car and they'll say like, like, oh, well, it's not their fault because of the way the lead driver transitioned or, or slowed, right? Right. So, you know, it's, there's a good example of that with uh, Osbo and Field. Right. And, you know, Osbo tapped the wall, it slowed him down just enough to throw Field off and the, the red lights came on on his window. Based off of that, they had to deem Osbo at fault, even though it didn't visually look like he slowed down a lot. Right. It threw that red light on, which, you know, you know, when you're that close, right on the very edge, that can make a huge difference. Right. And it's and I think it's tough for some of the the drift fans that are watching along to really understand the the aspect of, <laughs> you know, how how easy it can be to either misinterpret who's at fault or to make a claim that I drove, because we've seen this so many times, make a claim that a driver purposely slowed more than they want, more than it was intentional, right? Like there's yeah. always that, that cry of people that are just like, oh, it's intentional. They did it on purpose. Yeah, I don't think there might be some of that here and there, but I don't. I don't think so. I think a lot of the times it's usually just a, a, an actual mistake from whoever yeah. causes it. Like, you know, maybe they sit on the left foot brake a little bit too much. Yeah. And it slows them down more than they want to. Or, you know, a little, little handbrake jab here because they're starting to go offline. So to reset their line and yeah. unset, or and settle up the car, you know, you might quick grab it. But. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I personally don't think that they're all intentional, but I, I think from from the comment section when when stuff like that happens it heats yeah. up and all you see is people saying oh he did it on purpose right so, like yeah <laughs> so for someone who doesn't know any better so like when you said when you were talking about osbo and you said it turned on the, the red light so what 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 is what were the red lights like on uh well nick could tell yeah. you so on um, it used to just be a red light across the top of the windshield yeah now it's uh strips along both sides of the windshield okay and they're green under acceleration, yellow under slowing, but not under the decel definition that Formula Drift has. Okay. So if they're yellow, that's okay, but you're still slowing down in an area where you maybe shouldn't. But if they're red outside of a momentum zone, then that driver will be deemed at fault if, you know, say the chase car hits them. Oh, wow. So... Nick, those lights, they're all hooked up based off of parameters inside the Link ECU. Is that how it works? So they have a an AIM data box for those lights. And then there's uh, another Torque Hub box. That's the one uh, to transmit all the data for the live stream now. Okay, cool. They're still, they're still trying to perfect it. Uh, a couple of cars had some issues with it at Long Beach, but hopefully it'll be sorted out and working for Atlanta. But but now that so how that works is the lights are in place on the car and then they just put that box in before you run. Yeah, so that box is in during practice and during competition, and it it connects to the CAN bus system on the car and also uh, measures G forces. So that's how it determines the the lights and how they come on. Yeah, so it's it's an interesting topic. I mean, when 
um, you know, some of you, most of you will know if you're avid you know, Drift fans that there's been over the past, I would say four or five years, there's been a lot of integration of standardizing, you know, ECUs to a point and, and also trying to get data logging and different feedback that FD grabs from each car after every, every run. Right. Yeah. And so do you see that like as a driver, do you see that as a positive in the sense of trying to progress the sport toward not being as much like as subjective, or do you think that that sometimes doesn't really allow the sport to thrive? That's a great question. I think it's incredibly useful to a point if, if, you know, people start getting obsessed with data completely and start ignoring like the individual driving styles and stuff of drivers and different techniques that people use, then it might get a little hairy, but I think, you know, data is one of the most useful tools you can learn from. Yeah. If you had a look at the sport, um, well, you do. Uh, if you're looking at the sport as a, as a as a driver, right, who makes their living, uh, you know, quote unquote, on on operating in the sport, do you do you feel that their the sport has to continue to kind of take some of the uh, subjectiveness out of it, or do you think the subjectiveness in drifting is really what helps? make the sport exciting that's a tough one <laughs> yeah yeah i wasn't trying to stump you i just you know yeah. i think about like we you know and, and we have to look at it from a from a from a fan standpoint right mm -hmm. like we're watching these things there's always going to be people talking crap about the judges but you know that there's like you know we know we know these judges on a personal level and, and these guys are not they don't have an agenda. They don't get there, and they're like, "All right, let's see who we can promote this week." It's not wrestling. It's not WWE. They, they all make the calls from what they can can view and what the data they can see, and they're just trying to make good calls. But you know, they take a lot of crap for those calls. So, yeah. you know, I I think that there's you know it's hard. You look at a lot of sports. You look at F1. You look at you know uh, a lot of the different motorsports where there is a race. There's a time definitive thing that they need to do mm -hmm. and it's easier on some of those sports to put in very rigid rules that can probably use majority of data to to make a judgment call but drifting won't ever be that it can't be that right even even in d1 where they've got the drift boxes they still have in-person judges to right. make sure that those are proper numbers and that they actually add or subtract from those scores too, depending on what actually happened. Right. I, I, I've heard this argument so many times where some people are in the sense they're saying, Hey, look, you know, for the sport of drifting to continuously become a mainstream motorsport, it has to continuously take out the subjectiveness of the judging to a degree, right? Like it has to keep putting it into a standardized thing to get people on even play, playing fields. But then you'll have the advocate, the opponent to that basically saying, look, you know, the thing that makes drifting so exciting is, is that there are different cars. There are different platforms. There, it's not a NASCAR type thing. Mm -hmm. they, can, right. they can make different power levels. They're not, there's no restrictor plates, you know, set up over carburetors and, and, and crap like that. So I guess, you know, do you, do you see for the progression of the sport as far as being able to make it something where – it can exist on a mainstream type of level. Do you, do you think this sport has to go much more in the way of kind of making things very rigid and definitive, or do you think kind of it's reaching that point where it's kind of found the happy medium? I think it's getting to that happy medium. Uh, looking at the attendance for Long Beach, I mean, it was the biggest event that FD has ever had and the right. quickest they've ever sold it out to, which was insane. There's, yeah. There's so many people there. Awesome. I, you I would, think, yeah. You would say that this is the the Long Beach is probably the the event that gets, requires like it gets the most amount of fan spectators of all year. I would say Long Beach, Irwindale, and maybe Atlanta are probably the most. 
Well, they they also have the thing before uh, Long Beach, right? I think it's a, I think it's it after. Is it, no, but the, the, uh, the, 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 he's talking about the Grand Prix at Long Beach. No, no, no? Well, that too, that too as well, which is also big. It's a big but, weekend. No, no, but also they also have the the thing where they drive through the streets, um, with the parade. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about the FD parade. Yeah. Yeah. Is that? But that's yeah. is, is that only at Long Long Beach or? Yeah. 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 So, yeah like, that's... That also probably brings up a lot of the hype and drives attendance. Yeah. No. Oh, that's Nick. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit. It's uh, they do it on the Thursday night before. Uh, or qualifying day. Well, I mean, are the streets like absolutely packed with that? Like, you know, or or the, the media just make it look like that? Um, I think a little column A, a little column B. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Very like, PC, think, Nick. Very yeah. PC. <laughs> I think because uh, <laughs> uh, it's not a super far drive. They drive you know around the area where the convention center and it's the around the block are. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's basically around the block. Oh, wow. But, uh, <laughs> but once uh, seeing the, the video and the pictures and stuff from once they get to the destination, it's just filled to the brim with people. Wow. Now, maybe I can make a suggestion. I don't know if FD is listening. Uh, <laughs> I would say not. But if you are, here's a PR suggestion. Maybe on the Friday, maybe on the, the Thursday before the parade, right? You guys can, as a field spread out and deliver the mail to all the long beach residents by going through the neighborhoods and then this way you'll be able to kind of it's kind of like a knocking on every door to let them know fd is going to be here you guys could just take all the pro cars and and stuff and just head out into the neighborhoods delivering mail <laughs> i mean <laughs> <laughs> sorry nick i, I know there's no, no comment be... to that it's like <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm just trying to think about how i think you, i think it could happen <laughs> i mean for the and and I would even go as far to say that like now that James Dean is back, we have more right hand drive cars, so it makes it better. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. More, more male oriented. Because you'd have to go in reverse or drive on the wrong side of the street. Yeah, yeah drive, drive on the wrong, wrong yeah. side of the street. Yeah, these are technical problems or, or, that I think FD is going to have to work is, through. Is his or the only right hand drive car? We would. Do a, a handbrake turn at every mailbox F- yeah, now, yeah, listen, good. and then do that, another burnout right. leaving yeah. it yes. to turn back around right and maybe with like a sign on the roof that says like hashtag fdlb so that like you could try to get some social pictures up there to hype <laughs> the weekend yeah yeah see i don't know why we're not doing marketing for fd Hey, if they're if they're listening, I mean, I feel like we probably could have packed the stands even more. <laughs> <laughs> what is your what is your biggest takeaway from Long Beach um, this year from last year? I know last year was your first year, but like, there's obviously a learning curve there. Yeah, uh, last year I stuffed it good into the wall a few times. Right. Um, this year. Um, you know, I didn't obviously get the result that I wanted, but I was happy with how the team worked together. You know, uh, spotter work together. Um, you know, I I hit, I tapped the walls, but I didn't smash the walls. Mm. So the car came out in one piece. I don't have to take it to a frame machine. It's still straight. Didn't have to replace any suspension. So. Um, as a whole, I think it was still okay. Yeah. This is probably the one area in life that you'd rather have a tap than a smash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You know? So, I mean, you know, let's, let's chalk it up to that. Tapping is better. Tap it, tapping in this situation is better than smashing. Just give it a little tappy tap. tap. Right. Yeah. <laughs> just, a little, just a little tappy tap. <laughs> Oh man. So, so what's the, what's the outlook? I mean, look, you, you got, you got just a, a little bit of time here and we're going to be approaching Atlanta, mm-hmm. which is great because one, you know, your home area. Um, and two, I think Atlanta is, has some of the best drift fans in the whole country. Yeah. I mean, the amount of people also that come out to road Atlanta for FD, like, right. I mean, I used to be one of them. I still enjoy watching drifting there. And, yeah. you know, luckily this year, uh, Friday is a whole, besides the autograph signing is a, uh, an off day for pro. So we get to watch pro spec. Cool. Oh, that's, yeah, that's so crazy. That'll be, that'll be actually really fun. 
you know, get to see all the prospect guys compete. I've got, you know, I still have a ton of friends competing in prospect. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask a question that's going to be very difficult for you to answer because it requires a level of politically correctness, but I think you'll kind of get where I'm going. Every mm -hmm. year, the field changes. The skill level changes. I, we've watched it for, you know, for over for 20 years, you know, and um, and this year is obviously no different. We have we have um, different drivers. We have some new drivers. We have. Um, how do you feel overall? The field skill level and maybe some of the experience level has changed from last year to this year. I don't think it's changed much i think everyone is i mean everyone at this pro level is capable of winning an event right like, there's mm -hmm. there's not one person here who who doesn't have the ability to right you know, they may not have the car or the setup or the tire for that weekend or whatever but i mean everyone's here for a reason and everyone got here for a reason so yeah. it's one of those it's it's super difficult to to win at this level and you know especially with guys like James Dean and Kristoffs and Forrest coming back, you know, who have won in podiums and everything before. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no, when you, when, you, when you say that, the comment I think of that's the, what's the best was the Jared, uh, Jared said on the live stream was from, uh, Stuky, right? He said, he said, he asked Stuky when he was going up against, uh, Dean this weekend, that weekend, mm -hmm. what, uh, you know how he was feeling and he said really great he's like actually i think you know i'm in a great position he's like you know ca catch him early before he figures out how to drift again you know what i mean or something like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or something like that yeah. so i just thought that that was that was pretty funny that's what i was thinking <laughs> yeah i mean james is an absolute animal you put him in anything and he'll yeah drive it perfectly <laughs> right i mean and so watching him figure out this mustang i mean i know it's a it's a totally different animal to compare to you know, kind of his S chassis that he was driving, but like, man, it's, I, I, I really like having him back in the series. I feel like it rounds everything back out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's like people are, were asking me during the off season, Oh, are you nervous that James is coming back? And I'm saying no. Cause like, if you want to be the best, you have to be able to beat the best. And in order to be able to beat the best, you have to go against them. Oh, yeah, that's uh, you, Ricky Bobby. You can, you can't <laughs> see, you can't see how well you're doing or how, you know, uh, how your driving is progressing unless you can go against people like that. And yeah, that's part of the reason why I like competing at the pro level. Right, mm -hmm. and I think it also takes off the the asterisk, right? Like when, you know, and I've I've seen this before. Like you don't want to win a championship with the asterisk of but this person wasn't there, right? Like you want to win yeah. the championship <clears throat> and, and just know that <clears throat> you are the best. Yeah. Yeah. So it's super interesting. Um, things this year that you're looking forward to maybe, or even things that you you feel like you'll be able to appreciate more now that your rookie season is, in, in pro is over and you're, you know what I mean? Like focus change, different things. You're you're able to take a little bit more time to kind of, uh, you know, uh, analyze or anything like that. Uh, a big thing is fan interaction. Um, you know, not having to run everything, not having to, you know, go to the store mid event to get ice or drinks for the guys and, right. you know, missing out on, you know, being there to, to interact with fans is a huge thing. Um, yeah. You know, being able to, you know, just see everyone and be a part of that is is another huge thing with uh, joining with, with Jerry. So, listen, I, you're for people that have met Nick. Nick's a you, you're a, a down to earth, you know, fun to talk to dude, right? And you're a car guy. You're you're just like everybody out there. How has it been? having a fan base now of people that are excited to wait in line to have a signature from Mr. Nick Novak. It's, it's kind of weird at this point. <laughs> it's like, I, I still remember, uh, you know, 
back, you know, 2012, 13, for the next few years when, you know, I was going through the line and getting people's autograph. Yeah. And I still have some of those. Right. So it's, it's crazy now to be one of those people and to, yeah. to see people excited to see me because I remember being excited to see, you know, the guys that I'm competing with now. And that's another crazy thing for me is, you know, like I've been watching these guys that I've been competing with for like 10 years now. Yeah. yeah. And it's crazy because I'm in my head sometimes I'm just like, man, Osbo just ran with me. He just, he just chased me. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Is that, is that like, a, is that a really like, has, has the fandom or the fan boyness of, let's say 16 year old Nick war started to wear off to the point where like, it doesn't even, it's not registering as much when you're at the line with some of these guys or does it kind of always still kind of tuck in the back there? Um, there's it sometimes, sometimes it's there, um, depends on, on the moment. And like, if it's, if it's, you know, the beginning of the event and, you know, my first practice lap or something, you know, I'm just like, Oh, I get to run with this guy or, yeah, cool. you know, oh, yeah. I, I need to be sure I'm, I'm on my game for this guy if he's chasing me. So, it's a, you know it's an interesting point though it's like and it's probably another part that I don't really hear about in drifting but I mean <clears throat> people really don't give enough attention to how much mental um how much like how much how much this sport how much mental this sport really is you know what I mean like yeah it, you know yeah having the having the physical skill and having the the knowledge and all this stuff but like it doesn't matter if you can't get out there, shut it off, and go to work. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, like, and that's a, a big thing that I uh, I d learned in prospect was kind of, I mean, even now and then I still get, you know, some nerves, but I know how to kind of expect them now. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, like, qualifying nerves for sure, but... Uh, you know, competition, it's, it starts to become more excitement now than nerves. Right. Are there, have there been anything over the past few years from a mental standpoint that you've done or practiced or worked on to try to maybe help yourself settle, to try to put yourself in the right mindset, to prepare yourself maybe for getting uh, into the car and trying just to do what you know how to do. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got my, my routine on like, you know, the timing of when I get into the car, you know, when I put my stuff on and then kind of have that from hockey when I would try to, or when I would have the, uh, you know, my routine before a game or whatever. Um, but a lot of it is just, you know, trying to stay calm and not overthink things. Yeah. Because mm. when you when you overthink things, then your nerves get there, and then it's tough to control things. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like if you look at a lot of different sports, whether it be, you know, um, drifting, baseball, uh, football, bowling. I mean, like whatever they are, golf. Like all these sports. You know, they, there's a lot of uh, psychological aspects that you'll start to see some of the top players use, and and having, you know, having that 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 pre-run or pre-shot or whatever routine is, is part of it. So that you what you're doing is you're you're building in a layer of consistency that you can get comfortable with every single time, regardless of how the situation changes. Right. Right. And so you find that that brings you some comfort into establishing kind of like a rhythm of routine that that you're like, all right, all right, now I'm ready to drive. Right. Yeah. Are like getting there... getting getting in the right mental space is the is absolutely the biggest thing. Yeah. At this level. Yeah. Are there are there th major things or major pet peeves? In thinking about that routine that like that you know like they could potentially throw off your routine and really mess you up that you 
struggle to make sure <laughs> don't happen? Um, I don't think so. I think it's it's one of those. It's just just like you said, getting into that comfort area. Yeah. Um, and you know, if the timing is off a little bit, you know, I might be like, okay, I didn't get to do it like that, but okay, I'll make this work. Yeah. Then. So before we wrap up, because we've kept you now for two and a half days. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before we wrap up, I do want to ask one final question. We, we, we talk about simulators quite a bit when we talk to drivers now, and it's funny how like you're starting to see, well, not starting, you're, you're seeing in, in all forms of motorsport, these at home drift simulators that probably can be built for $5,000 and under, Mm -hmm. right? You're starting to see people that haven't had any real great skill level in real life. <laughs> yeah. Enter into some of these sports with the some confidence experience. and the there yeah. the experience. So with that all said, um, do you do any simming for some of these tracks before I you enter them? I'm not quite sure if simming is the word, but Why? we're, we're going to go is with that, it. Wait, is there anything wrong with that? Do, is there, an, is there a term know. that I'm no, going to like Google after no, this no, no, and no, find out? No, no, no. I don't out? think there's anything wrong with it, but All I'm right. just going to say we're just going to roll with that one. Because I just don't want to have any smash and simming get <laughs> get put together. And then... <laughs> but yeah, so it was simming. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, simming. Yeah, so during the offseason, <laughs> I compete in a series called Virtual Drift Championship, which my spotter, Craig, actually is part of running and he uh runs the live stream and does commentary on it crazy and uh yeah some of the skill that these guys have is just insane like you know you'll go in an event there's 70 drivers and the lowest score is still a 90 (laughs) right like (laughs) yeah like these guys just because they you know don't have to worry about you know tires you know reliability or anything like it's going to be consistent the whole time you just keep doing laps and keep doing laps and you know people get so good on it. wow <laughs> well my question would be do you feel like seat time transfers one-to-one on that yeah, uh sure. to a point yes wow um at the at the pro fd level <laughs> it helps but mm-hmm. it's not uh 100 supplementation that's crazy because so, now you bring in you bring in some of the gamers into this stuff and some of the people who are really about gaming they'll sit there for you know hours like you know maybe half a day straight probably you know yeah. I don't know some some people will just like to sit in front of their monitor and play all day long so sounds yeah, like, like me waiting for Chick Fil A <laughs> but <laughs> but that's just a way that people are gonna get really really accelerated seat time yeah I mean that's actually how I started drifting was on a simulator is so. that right yeah. Yeah, so I, I got a sim set up in 2012 and didn't start actually driving in 20, until 2016. Yeah. And then <laughs> once once I got a car that I could drift, it was okay. How how can I make this work? You know, okay, I need you know six tires for the next event or whatever. Yeah. And you know, just built it from there and was able. I feel like sim definitely helped with how fast I was able to progress. So. Going back to your first event ever, you, from the first time that you realize, like, all right, the, I don't even have, it doesn't even have to be an event. The first time that you physically got in a car to drift and you're coming from a simulator directly to, to a car, what was the experience like? Like you got in, you're like, oh my God, I don't know what, like, you know, like it's not the same or you got into the thing. And you were actually able to start linking some stuff. Like, what what is it like? Um, I think I only like over rotate. Like, I only spun out maybe twice that event, that first event. Right. And it was, uh, I think we had like six or eight sessions of like thirty minute sessions. Wow. And uh, yeah, a lot of it translated almost immediately. Uh, the one thing you don't get That's on amazing. a sim is the G force. Yeah. Wow. Right. Like that's and that's. That actually, I feel like, makes it once you feel how that reaction is gonna be, to make it, it easier, actually makes it easier. That's crazy when you think about that. That is, so that is that's, crazy. I feel like that's why a lot of guys that start on sim and go to real life don't have 
the same issues with going back to sim where you know if somebody starts in real life and goes to a sim yeah they'll, they'll have that issue because they're you know waiting for the g-force and it just never happens man i hate these conversations because every time i have a sim conversation with with like one like like a pro driver or something now i'm totally obsessed with the fact that i should have a simulator yeah, and then I mean, every time there must be five times a year that i contemplate on just here take all my money listen <laughs> i I told, I told Maxis i have two goals for 2023 my two goals for 2023 is to renovate my kitchen and get a sim rig that's it so you know we, <laughs> that's... we, we gotta get those going <laughs> sorry planet fitness you're not getting us <laughs> we, got, we got we got we got different goals guys. yeah I gotta, I gotta renovate my kitchen first <laughs> right? gotta renovate my kitchen yeah. and and get a drift sim that's what i'm saying right yeah so i i think i have my priority straight i think so i mean it sounds yeah. great yeah i'm essentials way better than going to the gym yeah i'm so <laughs> much happier with that like <laughs> I didn't even know that that was really an option for well, resolutions. Listen, I, you get, I get my shoulder workout at the sim and get a little cap workout. And yeah. yeah and hey, you, you know. just crank the force feedback. You're good. See? Yeah, just increase the steak allotment on your sandwich and you can get the get the biceps going. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, it's a 16 ounce now. I've gotten better. It was only an 8 ounce before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Yeah. All right, Nick. Last, last question. I promise. I know I've said that before. But yeah. – any advice for the person, for the people um, that are, let's say, out there, they don't, they they love drifting, they follow drifting along, they have their favorite drifters, and uh, and they do have a sim, and they've been playing. Like any any advice for somebody like that that maybe wants to crack into uh, drifting in real life. If you're gonna get a seat time car, make sure it's reliable. Because the last thing you wanna do is go to an event and just do nothing but work on your car. Like, you know, 350Zs, E36, E46, you know, there's preventative maintenance stuff that definitely needs to be done to make sure that they stay reliable. But I feel like they're, all the recipes are out there now with, you know, what, what mods to do, what mods not to do, uh, right. you know, to keep to keep these cars reliable, and you know, I mean, even Corvettes out of the box are, you know, you throw a little bit more angle at them because they don't have much stock, and you don't even have to do an engine swap on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's crazy. I'm now so uh, I'll put you on the spot a little bit. It, it, can we maybe in, invite you? uh in some way maybe the next time we're that we're with you in person do you think we could do a cool little piece of content where you can kind of do maybe like some of the top things um that you should do to prep your first drift car you think you could share some of that I advice with the world yeah for sure that'd be sick cool right mm -hmm. that'd be sick um that's it, man. Like I'm not gonna hold you anymore. We we you we have we owe you a great deal of gratitude for one humoring us with a with coming on the podcast, but two, um, you know, kind of uh, hanging with us through our technical stuff and uh, and I you know anytime we get to hang out, especially like when we were at SEMA last year, like really enjoy it just because you're mm -hmm. yeah. you're a straight up down down to earth dude, right? I try to be. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, Nick only made me uh, wait in line for his autograph twice ever. Yeah. You know, for the most part, he, you know, I only have to wait in line like a little bit. There you go. <laughs> no, you, th Nick, thanks so much for coming on and doing this. We wish you yeah, so much, so much luck and uh, and success this season. Uh, you deserve it. Yeah. Thank you. So. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was oh, fun. dude. It was, it was our pleasure. So listen, that's it. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, make sure you stay tuned to Formula Drift and go follow Nick Novak. Uh, we'll make sure his social information mm -hmm. is listed. Uh, follow Nick Novak to watch him uh, punish the rest of the FDA field. And and that's a quote. Yeah. Yeah, quote me, please. All right. <laughs> All right. Take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye. I don't know if he's still if he's still on or he bow out. Oh, we're still on.
Oh, we're still on. <laughs> well, this is going to make an enjoyable little uh, podcast. Anyhow, yeah. with that said, um, thanks for watching. <laughs> we appreciate it. It's exciting. I can take these earphones out of my ear. You can. Um, yeah, listen, I, I think that uh, a guy like Nick brings so much to the table because, you know, if you were just to go and even look at his personal social media, you'll see him reminiscing in memories about his first drift event in 2016. Now, in hindsight, that's, you know, six or seven years, and he's basically risen to the top of his sport yep. in the world. And that's that's an astronomical thing to think about that, that you know, you know, we talk about this, but it's happening more and more where you're seeing these people that are in, uh, you know, sit, you know, coming out of sim rigs and, 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 and escalating and really, you know, moving up in the sport quite a bit. Um, so I think it's an interesting aspect. And I also think that uh, people like Nick are going to be the people that push this sport forward and make sure that, you know, the sport is constantly filled with enthusiasts and it doesn't get to a level where it's not attainable enough for the average person to aspire to be a Formula Drift Pro driver mm -hmm. and actually get there. I, I wonder if, like, uh, any of the, the games or whatever are eventually going to be able to offer, like, licenses for the top people. I like, think that that's a terrible that, liability. You think so? <laughs> well, think about it like this. You put people into a missile, uh -huh. a missile, a 3,000-pound missile that essentially is going to enter some of these, you know, courses at, at 100 miles an hour, Right. And I mean, they still have well, to have the feeling. You, you know what? I would almost kind of beg to, to differ that it would be almost like uh, when you start seeing these like, when you start seeing like the YouTubers now, the YouTubers are going to boxing and they they want to fight boxers and stuff like that. Do you think that. that's a fair comparison though? No, now that I'm talking about it, maybe not. But <laughs> but, it is, but it is a talking point. But All right. So, you know, in other words, they, they have exposure because of their credibility from right. online and then they go into a more professional setting and then, you know, sometimes they don't do half bad, so... Right. Maybe a similar parallel. I mean, I can see. Do you, do you get what I'm getting at, at least? I, I do. Yeah. I mean, I still think that if that's going to happen, you ha there has to be maybe something that brings you from sim to real life to, oh, yeah, he's got the skill to try this. Oh, yeah, he's got the skill. Okay. Well, instead of like a literal credibility, it kind of just makes it interesting. Yeah. I mean, if anything. I, I, just, I just think that there's, there's, you know, when you're a driver, um, you know, in... Uh, in Formula Drift, I think that, you know, there's two sides to the story. There's the first side, which is do you have the skill level, but the other side of it is can you be repeatable enough that allows the driver behind you or, or you know, whatever, to feel secure to, to push the limits? Because, you know, the thing is uh, when it comes down to the proximity and the pressure and the, the actual, you know, mental part, of having of putting it in real life where there's real consequences to crashing and to having um and to having cars you know inches away from you yeah. while you're traveling at you know 60 70 80 miles an hour mm -hmm. i think that there is uh there's a a great deal of gravity that comes there right um and i think that you can't that's the one part i don't think you can get from a sim i think you have to experience that in real life but i mean you're right could there ever be one of those things i mean i think it would be an absolute interesting show but could there ever be like uh like some sort of virtual drift champion like that like they were talking about and then the, and then x amount of people for let's say they have 10 events throughout the year those 10 people then physically show up and they start competing sorry to interrupt did you see bank trailer no Mm. Well, it's interesting. Is it is all fictional? Fictional though, or? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. cool. I've I've seen people talk about the trailer, but I haven't seen it yet. I haven't so, seen it. I don't know. It's interesting stuff. But that's it, right? Yep. I think we're gonna we're gonna get back to to work. You know, making those things that you call wheels. That you know, that's what you like, like actually that, care like about. That one. Like that one. Ooh, Ultragram coming your way, baby. Check it. This month they're landing. It's yep. happening. The Eagles have spread their wings <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> come on i got a whole bunch of these we can just keep going but we shouldn't right back to work all right take care of uh, take care everybody yes. we'll catch you on the next one bye